The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. The following program is closed captioned for the thinking impaired. By tomorrow, I will rule the world! <laughs> you think he's gone? He's not gone! That's the whole point! He's never gone! Is this some radical new therapy? You see? <laughs> well, I must have not been paying attention. When you were just talking to me Do you think that you could repeat the question? And I listen I'm guzzling this coffee <laughs> Some days there must have been something in I can't count how many times I've said I wish I wasn't here But boy do I really wish I wasn't here to me Sorry Wow But I've done shows with no sleep before, and this will not be the last either, so. Melvin Taylor is playing the week after the bash, so I wasn't going to ask because I thought he wasn't feeling well, but now that I see he's playing after the bash, we'll see if we can get him the night of the bash to come sing this song for us. Heck yeah. We always, we always start with Melvin doing this song at the beginning of the show, and then he got sick. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the week. It's like the Friday after the bash. So we might actually have like an after bash party at the Melvin Taylor concert the following week. I love that guy. I love his music, but I love him as a person, too. That's so weird, you know? Not that I'm comparing them, but it's kind of like when I met Eddie Bunny. Okay. And he was like, hey, why don't you sit down and have a drink, dude? Hey, baby, how you doing? How you? And we sat there, we talked for like three and a half hours. Ba, 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 ba. Wow, 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 I hit all the buzz. I sat with Eddie Bunny for like three hours just talking about stuff. It was like the coolest thing in the world. So I remember being like eight years old listening to his music, thinking how cool he was. There I was as a grown-up sitting across the table from him. Couldn't believe it. All right, we should probably get this show on the road. What do you think? Let's go for it. Okay. Hi, how you guys doing? My name's Tom Duggan. You're with the Paying Attention Podcast. Hi, top two guys, Smoke Shop at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. We are celebrating this week the 20th anniversary of the Valley Patriot newspaper. And there's been a little bit of confusion, so I'm going to clear it up now um, because there's so the, we do so much at the Valley Patriot that it's easy for the casual observer to be confused. So there are a lot of people who think that this is the 20th anniversary of the Valley Patriot bash. But the bash is the celebration of the Valley Patriot newspaper's anniversary. So it's not the 20th anniversary of the Valley Patriot bash. We wanted to do a one-year anniversary after we started the paper. And just kind of bring everybody together and have fun. And um, But we, we, couldn't, we couldn't on the first... Ad- First anniversary, and then we tried it again on the fifth anniversary. We just couldn't really figure out what we wanted to do. There was a lot of infighting, and I had a girlfriend at the time that just had to control everything. So nobody wanted to work with us. So after I broke up with that person um, in 2011, come 2012, all of my friends came to me and said, hey, remember that idea you were talking about, like having an anniversary bash for the paper? Now that she's out of your life, we're more than happy to come back to the table and work with you on this. Mm-hmm. So, it, so the first bash was in March of 2012. It was our eighth anniversary, but it was also the March edition was our 100th edition of the paper. Now, if you do the math, you're going to say, well, that doesn't work. And it doesn't work when you do the math because you're counting, uh, we uh, we're a monthly paper, so you're counting months. Right? And it doesn't work into the math. But the reason it doesn't work into the math is because for the first seven or eight years of the paper, we did an additional election edition. So we'd put out the October edition of the paper. And then mid-October, we'd publish another edition called the election edition that had sample ballots, ballot questions, profiles on all the candidates uh, in, in Lawrence Bethune uh, and Haverhill at the time. And so we did a couple of specialty editions along the way, which caught us up a little faster on, on the number of editions that we're at, if you're doing the math. But we walked, we went into the VFW in North Andover. It was uh, three feet of snow out that day. And we expected maybe 15 people to show up, maybe, you know, a couple of our writers, a couple of our delivery drivers. 
we'd sit around, have a couple of drinks, and then I'll go home and call it a good night. And then when it started snowing that morning, and it was three feet of snow by the time the bash started at the VFW in North Andover, we figured nobody was going to come, and we were going to end up just like, I don't know, going away for the weekend or something, myself and my, my new girlfriend at the time, my newer girlfriend. Newer girlfriend? Yeah, it was my newer girlfriend, right? <laughs> so so we, we sat in the room. We had a DJ. We had uh, uh, Keith Wadica donated some free coffee and some finger sandwiches. And within about 20 minutes, there were 350 people in the room, and we couldn't believe what was going on. In fact, at one point, the North Andover cops came in and said, listen, you are so way over capacity that we're getting complaints from the neighbors. So at least 20% of the people in this room have to go downstairs into the bar until you clear it out. And so people kept getting up, like Jim Lyons, who was our state rep at the time, got up and gave us a proclamation. And uh, a few other people came and gave us stuff and said, hey, it's your anniversary. Here, we wanted to bring you something. And we walked out of the room that night carrying all this stuff back to our car. And I kept thinking, you know, this, this is not why we did this. We did this for like just a nice celebration. But if people are willing to come to an event and bring stuff for us, maybe they'd be next year willing to come and bring some stuff for other people. And that's when I got together with Chris Eldridge from the Lawrence High School Alumni Association. And we decided to start trying to raise money for a scholarship for the following year. I said, if people are going to come and they're going to bring us like gift certificates and other stuff, why don't we just like raffle it all off? Why don't we like find a way to like use this event to help somebody else? Cause we're doing fine. Like we don't need stuff, right? We didn't do this. So people could bring us stuff. Like when you have a birthday party, when people are bring you presents, that's not what this was for. This was actually to thank the people that helped us get here. So the following year we did a scholarship. We gave the kid, his name was, uh, his name was, uh, Devin, and if you give me a second, I'll remember his last. I'll, I will remember his last name. Um, but we we gave him, I think, a hundred dollars, and we thought that was like we were changing the world. We gave a kid a hundred dollars. He's going to use that for his books, and and you know, without that hundred dollars, maybe he wouldn't be able to afford his application. Who knows? And we walked out of there thinking we had done something great. Well, let me tell you how this event has morphed. This Valley Patriot Bash last year, we raised and gave out fifty four thousand dollars. And it was incredible to watch all these people coming together after all these years. But the bash is a celebration of the Valley Patriots newspaper's anniversary. So it's not the 20th anniversary of the Valley Patriot bash. It's the 20th anniversary of the Valley Patriots. So let's bring up, this is our lead story. The Valley Patriot went to print at 5 a.m., which is why I have not been to bed. We're actually taping this on Tuesday uh, we're airing it on Thursday, so that's why I'm still a little tired. So this is the front page. If you haven't seen it on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter, or on the newsstands, this is our 20th anniversary edition. And I have to tell you, looking at that lead story, Salisbury Slander, I, I, I'm, I'm so grateful for all the people that have helped us do what we do. But when I look at that headline... And then I go back to the very first edition of the Valley Patriot, which was school board members stealing money from, from the Lawrence Public Schools. And, and I look at what we're doing now, and I see that headline on the 20th anniversary, and it's almost like you could have predicted this. It's almost like back in 2004, you could have said, you know, if this newspaper survives 20 years, what will they be doing in 20 years? Exactly the same thing they're doing now. And that's just going out, and finding people who are corrupt in our government and exposing them. And the real frustrating thing about, if there's anything frustrating about being in this business, is that I learned somewhere around that eight-year mark when all the splitting up happened and we, you know, we got new board members and a whole bunch of things changed. I learned that if a newspaper public, like let's say you've got, um, let's say you've got a cop in your community and then the newspaper publishes a story that he's on the take and they print pictures of them taking money from somebody. Do you know that the government doesn't investigate that just because it's in the newspaper? Like, at the eight-year mark, there was a couple of stories that we published about very serious corruption going on in the Merrimack Valley. And after about six months, I picked up the phone and called the DA's office and said, are you even looking into this? Like, I haven't heard a thing since we published these stories. We've got proof. We've got sign-off sheets. We've got copies of credit card receipts. We've got eyewitness testimony. We've even got audio recordings. And we published all of this. When are these people going to fucking jail? 
And the DA's office was run by John Blodgett at the time. The woman that I spoke to on the phone, I don't remember her name, but she said to me, well, Mr. Duggan, did anybody file an official complaint? I'm like, it's on the front page of the fucking newspaper. I, do I, you're telling me I need to go down there and fill out an actual complaint? Like that somebody has to actually like go down and complain? You're, you're the DA's office. You don't read the paper? You don't look at that and go, wow, they've got all kinds of evidence that a, a, a firefighter's dispatcher was snorting coke off of the, off the, off the 911 desk and ignoring 911 calls for help. Nobody, nobody's investigating this? Like, really? Uh, seriously? So that was, that was probably one of the most frustrating things to learn is that when I publish stories like this and when I publish stories like I did in the very first edition of the Valley Patriot, about school board members, literally in Lawrence, literally stealing money from the school children of Lawrence, that just because it's in the newspaper doesn't mean anybody in government's going to do a goddamn thing about it. So for those of you who consume the news, if you see it in the Globe, the Herald, the Lowell Sun, the Valley Patriot, you probably won't see anything interesting in the Eagle Tribune because they've, they've, they've long stopped doing any investigative journalism. But if you do see a story in any of your local newspapers, it's incumbent on you guys to pick up the phone and call law enforcement, to call the attorney general's office, to email the district attorney's office, send them a copy of it and say, hey, what are you doing about this? Hey, we'd like to file a complaint. We want to know if this is true. We want an investigation. And so that, that's, I think of everything in the last 20 years, that's probably one of the things that's the most frustrating. Because when I first got into this business, I really believed that if we were writing stories about corruption and proving it in the newspaper, that the government would have to respond. They don't. They don't. They don't give a shit. They don't care. It's, it's too much work for them. You have to literally walk into their office and file an, an official complaint and do their fucking work for them because they're government workers. And as we've learned in the last time, we've learned a lot, by the way. I'm going to come in, I'm going to do a story after the bash about all the things that we've learned publishing a newspaper for the last 20 years, because some of it, like what I just explained to you, will astound you. Like, that's pretty, everybody who just heard me explain that to you probably shook your head when I started saying it, saying, no, that can't be true. It is true. It is true. In fact, there was a Lawrence police officer that we wrote a story about, Bill Green, probably about 10 years ago. And we started detailing how this guy was stealing money, too. And I ran into, I think, the chief. I don't even think it was Roy Vasque at the time. I think it was the chief before him. And I ran into either him or the deputy chief one day. And I said, hey, what are you guys going to do something about this Bill Green character? And they were like, uh, well, what do you mean? I was like, what do you mean, what do I mean? I'm publishing stories every month about how this guy's stealing money, and, and you guys aren't even investigating him? Well, did you file a complaint, Mr. Duggan? I was like, you got really, really Really? All right. So um, we are celebrating our 20th anniversary, and I want to thank everybody. Uh, I especially want to thank, and we're going to get back to that lead story in a second, but I especially want to thank Bob Damon from Graphic Developments, who has been publishing my newspaper for 20 straight years. And he has carried us through the Columbia gas explosions. When the Columbia gas explosions happened, Two-thirds of my advertisers were shut down. They were in the affected area. We had no revenue coming in, and they continued to publish us anyway. They carried us. And when I was in the hospital last year, for well over a month, there was no revenue coming in. And, and, and Bob Damon and uh, Bill Samadis and Jay and Helen and everybody at Graphic Development, they worked with Nancy while I was in the hospital, while I was in a coma, while I was trying to get better, they worked with her and they, and they continued publishing us. And during COVID, when the whole world was shut down, we continued publishing. But all of our advertisers were closed. So we couldn't bill our advertisers and they carried us. They, 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 I can't say they didn't charge us. They charged us, but they didn't make us pay them right away. They carried us on credit. And by the way, we still owe them money. We still owe them a lot of money thanks to COVID. Thanks to everybody shutting the world down for no reason. But they carried us. And because they carried us, the Valley Patriots are celebrating our 20th anniversary. I want to thank one more person before we get to our lead story. Mike Gagliardi, president of the local laborers union, local 175 in Methuen. You would never in a million years believe that me and this guy were friends. 
Like, knowing what you might know about him, he's the president of a labor union, and knowing me as the right-wing lunatic who hates unions, you would think that the two of us would never be friends in a million years. And yet, he has been our biggest financial backer going back to 2004. In fact, he called me when our first edition came out in 2004, and he was laughing. And he said, you know, Duggan, I like you. I don't agree with anything that you say that has to do with politics. But I like you because you're going after sacred cows. You're going after people the Tribune's afraid to go after. You're publishing stories about public officials that the Tribune and the Globe and the Lowell Sun are afraid to go after. And I love that. He said, I want any time you hit a financial problem, I want you to call me and the Laborers Union will buy a full page ad to help you out. Anytime you have an event in the community, we will sponsor you. Whatever you want, we will be there for you. Because even though I know you hate unions, we love the First Amendment here at the Laborers Union Local 175. And as long as you're going to be continuing to put your opinion and the opposing opinion in your newspaper, and you're going to represent all sides, we're in. We're with you. We're with you no matter what's going on. So through COVID, he helped us out. Through Columbia Gas, he helped us out. Um, He actually donated, I think, $2,000 when I was in the hospital. And Nancy called him and said, you know, Tom's not doing well, and we're trying to keep the lights on here at the Valley Patriot while he's in the hospital. He donated a shit ton of money, like out of pocket, to try and help us out. And so I want to say thank you to Mike Gagliardi, who for 20 straight years, even though, and despite the fact that we have exact opposite political views. He has been the, he has been the number one bedrock. There's been, there's been other people, but I want to highlight him because he's been the number one financial backer and bedrock of the Valley Patriot. And I said to DJ Borogod one day about, I don't know, maybe five years ago, I said, you know, you'd be surprised if I told you who our financial backers really were. You would be, sh- you would be shitting your pants if you knew who you were pissing off every time you attacked the Valley Patriot. And so that's just a little preview. I'm not even going to tell you who the rest of them are today. We'll do it on another show. Uh, maybe even I'll do it at the microphone at the bash. And that's, by the way, no, that's not a shot at DJ at all. Like, we've kind of repaired our relationship. But I, I'm just using it as an example. You know, there are times when people throw rocks at me, and I look at them knowing how much they depend on people that are financial backers of my paper. And I look at them and I go, you really want to attack the Valley Patriot right now? When you desperately need so-and-so and and he's sitting on my board. But see, most people don't know who sits on my board. And I did that on purpose because I don't want people treating me special because they're afraid of who's on my board. I want them to come after me anyway so I can crush them with who's on my board. That's what I want. I want to make like when, when, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, D bro Brown. Yo, 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 popping and cracking and cracking and popping. You know, when that guy on Facebook, starts coming after me and starts attacking the Valley Patriot. I have one board member that calls me every single time it happens. It goes, why don't you just tell them that I'm sitting on your board and just really freak them out. And I'm like, no, I'm just, I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for the big bomb to drop on my head. I'm waiting for him to really come after me. Cause then when he really comes after me, then I'm just going to say, release the Kraken. That's what I'm going to do. And we'll see what happens then. And I won't even have to fight my own battle. Cause there's at least two people on my board ready to go every single time it happens. So, Happy anniversary to everyone. I want to thank all of our advertisers, our readers, the editors, our current editors, and all of our previous editors, all of our sponsors of The Bash every year. Um, it, 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 has been, it has been a great 20 years of investigating. By the way, sued six times, never lost. Never lost a lawsuit. We've been sued six times. And I think that's just a testament to the great lawyers that we have Um, And I certainly appreciate attorney Peter Caruso in Andover, who never charges me for representing me in First Amendment cases, which is how we were actually able to get out from underneath the Jujuga lawsuit, because he thought he was going to be able to bankrupt me with the lawsuit. And then when he found out that Peter Caruso wasn't charging me any money to represent me, all of a sudden, everybody came to the table. All of a sudden, that went away really fast. So thank you to Peter Caruso as well. All right, so let's get back to our uh, our lead story. So the headline is Salisbury slander. Wait, should we do the the bash thing first, or we'll do it at the end? Do it first. All right, before we get back, get to Salisbury. Um, so we have a new tote board. Now this is as of Tuesday. 
I know you're watching this on Thursday, so it might be slightly higher, but we've had no donations the last couple of days, so it's probably going to be very close. And you've got that there. i got to pull it up here because I can't see that. That's what happens when you get old. Uh, fudge, right? It was here, and then it was gone. Uh, we'll find it in the bash folder. I didn't even think our sponsors yet either. We'll get to it. Just a hodgepodge of a show today. All right, so we have, does that say 32,065? Sure pretty does. good, pretty good. Lawrence High School Junior ROTC for Eileen Suarez, 7,255. The Dan Cody Memorial Scholarship for Bridget Gaffney. That's uh, North Andover High School, 5,105. Both, by the way, both of those scholarships were over $10,000 last year at the end of the, at the end of the night. Methuen High. Now, I have to apologize a little bit to all of our Methuen friends. I was really castigating you guys because this was at the very bottom a couple of months ago, and you really stepped up, and I appreciate that. Um, a big thank you goes to Ronnie Marsan for that, uh, who is also a sponsor of the show. This is our Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. Methuen High School Scholarship started by our good buddy right here, Dave Garafalo, here at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. 4475 And what's great about this scholarship is somebody called me last week and said that they are going to match dollar for dollar every donation that comes in up to $1,500 total. So if you Venmo $25 to this scholarship today, I'm going to post your name. I'm going to post that you donated $25. And then I'm going to add $50 to her total because that $25 is going to be matched by our anonymous donor who does not want to be thanked publicly, which is why I love them even more. I love them even more. When someone does that, I don't even know who this person is. I only know their name, but I am going to find this person and give them a hug when this is all over. Because when someone does something really good and says, I don't want credit, that's somebody who's truly doing it for the right reason. And I run into so few of those people in my life that when I find a person like that, I just want to hug them. Where else are we? The Edmund Lowe Scholarship. Now, this is kind of an interesting scholarship. It works very differently than all the other scholarships. So my computer technician is Mr. Lowe. It used to be Mr. and Mrs. Lowe. Mrs. Lowe passed away during COVID. And uh, they're right here on their Jasmine's Computer Service right here on Route 28 in Salem, New Hampshire. And I walk in with my computer and they take care of my computer for me. And uh, they're wonderful people. And I found out one day, thanks to our good buddy, Dave LaCroix, a mutual friend, that their son was the first American troop to die in Afghanistan. His name was Edmund Lowe. So every year we invite them to the bash for free as Gold Star family. And every year they come and uh, they do a scholarship in the name of their son in June. And every year I always say, you know, there's got to be a way we can merge our efforts here. They're doing a scholarship. They come to our thing. We go to their thing. So Carrie Weiland from Isaiah 58 right here in Salem, New Hampshire, called me last year and said, let's do something really special for the Lowe's. Let's see if we can raise them some extra money for their scholarships. And then when you go to their event, they can, help you, they can have you help present the check to their kid the way you have them come up and help present the check to another kid. So um, that scholarship is at $4,025. Greater Lawrence Tech Scholarship is at 3405 And now we hit the bottom three. Please consider donating to these three scholarships. The Whittier Tech Scholarship. Corin, I hope I'm saying it right. Corin Urena, 2750 The Dan Strange Memorial Scholarship. I miss that fucking guy every single day. He was such a good person. He helped us so much. <clears throat> He is, uh, his scholarship is for a Haverhill High School student, Lizette DeFeria, and she is a junior ROTC cadet going into, she's going to be an EMT, so that's why she ended up getting that at 2715. And then a surprise special needs scholarship bringing up the rear. That was near the top last year, by the way, 2335. I think one of the reasons that that's so low this year is because. Uh, we we haven't announced who it is. It's the only scholarship we don't have a name attached to or a picture because the kid who's getting it is going to be in the room and we're going to surprise her that night. So we had to make a decision. Do we release the name and not surprise them and maybe raise them a little bit more money or do we oh, do we try to surprise? And so we went with the surprise uh, uh, angle and it's not working out well for us. So... Uh, Please, if you could donate to the special needs scholarship student, um, 
she's going to be in the room that night, and she has no idea it's coming, and we're going to have a nice check for her. I'd like it. I'd like it to be closer to five thousand dollars if we can get it. All right, I got, tw- I got twelve minutes left. Is that really true? Wow. I, you know what? I could spend three hours just talking about the bash and 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 never have to fill time. All right. So let's let's talk about this lady. So let's let's bring her picture up. Boy, wow. Look at her. Is she not beautiful or what? <laughs> imagine imagine meeting that in a dark alley. Wow. Who you're looking at there is Lisa Pearson. She is the planning director for the planning board for the town of Salisbury. As you can see, she's one of those crusty earth women. And when I called her that to someone who knows her very well, they laughed on the phone last night and said, yeah, you get that about right. That's, that's, that's about right. She is a crusty earth woman. So um, Lisa Pearson decided back in two, uh, 2022. Wow. Wake up, Tom. Back in 2022, Lisa Pearson, as the planning board director, the director of the planning board, decided that she did not want a Salisbury resident named Ron Tony Giordano to be on the planning board. Ron Tony Giordano applied for the planning board, and she flipped the hell out and started running around and telling members of the board of selectmen and the town manager that Ron Tony Giordano was a registered sex offender. Yeah, you got that right. In order to keep this guy off of a local planning board, she ran around telling the town fathers that Ron Tony Giordano was a registered sex offender to keep him off the board. She also went further, which is where I think she's getting herself in trouble now in court. She also went further and threatened to sue the town and each individual selectman personally if they appointed Ron Tony Giordano to the planning board in Salisbury. Wow. Wow. Now, I've been doing this, as you saw. I've been doing the Valley Patriot for 20 years. I've been doing radio for 35. I've been involved in politics since 1985. You can do the math on that one. This is probably one of the most horrible things I've seen a human being do to somebody else ever. And by the way, I don't care what Ron Tony Giordano's background is. If he's not a registered sex offender, if he's not a sex offender, and you ran around telling people he was a sex offender to keep him off a public board, wow, there's a special place in hell for you, lady. Wow. I mean, imagine what she did to this guy. Imagine for the rest of his life, he has to look over his shoulder, worrying that some asshole out there isn't going to clock him because he heard that he was a sex offender. Because there's some crazy, violent people out there. And when you accuse somebody of something like this, it gives crazy people an opportunity to be violent. I've seen it happen. I have a kid I went to high school with that was wrongly accused of raping someone. The accusation was on the front page of the paper, but when he got exonerated and it turned out it was a totally different guy, that was on page 96. And most people didn't see that. And this kid... This kid, at least back in the 90s, was getting jumped on a regular basis. Had to move out of Lawrence. Because everybody in this neighborhood thought he was a sex offender. And this lady used that to keep someone off a planning board? So that, I guess, now raises a whole bunch of other questions, doesn't it? Because if you're in the business that I'm in, nobody ever does that just because they're mad. Right? I mean, there are evil people out there that, you know, that maybe sometimes do that just because they're mad. But most of the time... When someone takes that kind of an effort, when someone goes to that length to keep someone off a public board, it's because they've got something to hide. And what I'm being told now, and we are very, very seriously and very deeply looking into the background of Lisa Pearson, is that she's really cozy with all of the developers in town. And when you talk developers in Salisbury, you're really only talking about one guy. There's other people involved, but when you're talking developers in Salisbury, you're really only talking about Wayne Capilupo. That's who you're talking about. And so we are going to be looking, and we are going to be digging, and I'm going to be talking to the Attorney General's office, and I'm going to be talking to a lot of people in government. Not that it's going to get me anywhere, because that that whole crew in Salisbury uh, have so much influence in government that that most of the people that you're calling, whether it's the Attorney General's office, the DA's office, most of them are in bed together. So, so it's generally not going to 
uh, result in what you think it's going to when you stop making calls. But I'm going to do it anyway because that's how you scare up the information. That's how you tip off the other side that you're on to them. And maybe at the very least, they won't go to jail, but maybe at the very least, they, they'll stop doing what they're doing, at least for a little while. So we are looking into Lisa Pearson. Um, Ron Tony Giordano filed a lawsuit, and he's not even asking for a specific dollar amount in his lawsuit. He's going to leave it up to the court as to what they deem he should get as compensation for her running around town and telling, not like her neighbor, not like texting one of her friends from college, running around and telling elected officials and the town manager that this guy's a registered sex offender. And that if he gets appointed to the planning board, she's, she's going after all of them personally. So he files this lawsuit, and yesterday I got a copy of the town of Salisbury's answer to the lawsuit. Ladies and gentlemen, you're not going to believe what they're fucking saying in court. Let me tell you what they're not saying in court. The town of Salisbury is not saying, well, it's true, he's a sex offender. They're not saying that, because that's not true. And by the way, that's the number one defense to any slander or libel lawsuit is if it's true, because if somebody is a sex offender and you call them a sex offender, you can't be sued for slander because the number one element in a slander lawsuit is what you say has to not be true. Here's what else they're not saying. They're not saying, well, she didn't say that. She didn't. We have no idea when Mr. Giordano got that information. She never said that. Well, maybe other people say she said that, but you have proof she said it. They're not saying that. So they're not saying that he is a sex offender, and they're not saying she didn't tell people that he's a sex offender. You know what their defense in court is? <laughs> Pull your car over if you're listening in a car. I don't want you to hit anybody when I tell you this. Their, their defense in court is we have immunity. That's their defense. That as a town, we're immune when one of our public employees tells other public employees that someone is a sex offender when they're not. That it's okay to slander a member of the public and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't hold us accountable. That's, that's their defense in court. That's like a guy rapes somebody and when the cops catch him, he goes, yeah, I did it, but you know what? I've got immunity, nothing you can do. Like, is that not the most despicable thing you've ever heard? I've heard a lot of things. Listen, even Willie Lantigua on his worst day would never call someone a sex offender if they weren't. Even Willie Lantigua, as, as, as bad as we think he was when he was the mayor of Lawrence, on his worst day wouldn't do that. Even Jim Jajuga, well, maybe he might. He might. But, but Willie Lantigua wouldn't. Wow. So their defense is not, well, he is a sex offender. And their defense isn't, well, she didn't say that. Their defense is, yeah, it happened. Sure. But we have immunity. There's nothing you can do about it. Well, I don't believe that for a minute. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I did read through what they're claiming is their, is their immunity on this. But I seem to remember a whole bunch of other cases uh, in the Lawrence area, not the Salisbury area, where police officers slandered someone and told someone's neighbors that they were involved in a crime they weren't involved in. And I think I remember that person getting like upwards of $8 million for that slander. So I don't know legally if they are immune, but boy, they shouldn't be. And if they are, if the town of Salisbury cannot be held responsible for this, if Lisa Pearson has immunity that she can run around and call people sex offenders and she's got immunity from that because she works for the town of Salisbury, then we need to get Estella Reyes and Ryan Hamilton and Francisco Polino on this show, our state representatives, and talk about changing that law. But I don't think that's the case. Without looking it up, I don't think that's the case. I think I remember multiple occasions, public employees slandering people and those people getting a payday. But shame on Lisa Pearson. If any of this is true, even a scintilla of it is true. And it has to be true. Because if it wasn't true, Salisbury's, by the way, out-of-town Boston lawyers that they're now paying 
even though you've got town council that you're already paying. Go, by the way, they, they, think about that for a minute. They didn't give this case to their regular council. They gave this case. They hired outside counsel from Boston to pay them all kinds of money to defend them on this. So they know how serious this is. And a pox on Neil Harrington and a pox on the, on the, on the selectmen for letting this go. From, two, from 2022 to now, that's two years, and nobody knew what these people were doing behind the scenes, how they were destroying this guy's life. Listen, even if this guy gets a $10 million payday, he still has to look over his shoulder for the rest of his fucking life that someone's going to clock him. That some guy who's, whose daughter was molested somewhere doesn't hear this story and then just loses shit and go after the guy. Because that is the, the social dichotomy that we live in in this country right now. That is the social uh, 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 construct that we have in this country right now. And I don't know how she escapes this. And I don't know how Salisbury escapes this. But I am thrilled on the 20th anniversary of the Valley Patriot that we still have a vehicle where we can expose it. Because without the Valley Patriot, nobody would know. This has been going on for two years she's been doing this. And nobody knew. At least the public didn't know. All the insiders knew. This guy's, this guy's reputation has been destroyed in Salisbury. But how many of those people who heard that rumor believed it and didn't realize it was untrue until Ron Tony Giordano filed a lawsuit? So you can expect in uh, the next Valley page, we will be doing a follow-up story. I'm going to be digging very deeply into Lisa Pearson and her cozy relationship with certain developers in town. We've already mentioned one. I understand there's a couple of others, but really they're all kind of, they're all, they all kind of work together. That's why I mentioned only one person. Because at the end of the day, when you boil it all down, it all really comes back to the same three or four people. And, and I mentioned two names today <laughs> that they are, and we're going to keep digging and we're going to keep exposing. And you can bet someone's coming after me. You can bet Someone's going someone's gonna to attack me within the next couple of weeks down the line. They're going to they're gonna try and destroy my credibility because they know I'm looking into it. You can bet. I mean, I'll, every, I'll bet you everything that I own that next month at this time when I'm sitting here, we're talking about somebody coming after me. Whether it's filing a lawsuit or making threats or having somebody really big show up at my office and give me some you know, fatherly advice, um, it's going to happen because it always does when you when I start to expose a certain group of corrupt people in the Merrimack Valley. And once again, we're on a story that involves corruption, and it all goes back once again to the same group of people. So uh, you can roll up Melvin Taylor at the end of the show. I want to thank everybody uh, for everybody involved in the Valley Patriot, uh, 20th anniversary. I want to thank Chrissy, my fine, fine producer. I want to thank our sponsors, McLennan Real Estate Century 21, the Zany Pesci Peche Pesh Law Office. And by the way, Jane Zany Pesci is going to be our MC at the Bash two weeks from tomorrow. Marsan and Sun Construction. Ronnie Marsan gave us $1,000 this year. We appreciate him. EIS, Investigation and Gun Training. A free shout out to Time Out Sports Bar in Haverhill. I was there for the grand opening the other day. The food was amazing. Uh, I, I gained seven pounds while I was there, but it almost seemed worth it. Uh, Tomo and Shake and Seafood. Clear Path for Veterans, New England. AFC Urgent Care. Lisa Williams is going to be featured prominently at the Bash this year. Pleasant Valley Landscaping Contractors. And our buddies at JG's Ice Cream. And speaking of JG's Ice Cream... The story that we did about the project on 110 is in this current edition of the Valley Patriot. You can get it on the streets everywhere in the Merrimack Valley. Sounds like Melvin Taylor says we got to go home. So go home already. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.